woman and it's next to me. Uh, 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 erase my fantasy. Girl, you know you conquer me in a real life, in a dream. Right, it's 18 minutes to the hour of 7 o'clock. Welcome back to The Morning Brew here on CNC3. We just spoke with the deputy political leader of the PDP, Farley Augustine, who suggested that there is a standing order within the THA that allows them to elect a presiding officer. It speaks about when a, stand, a standing order is silent on something, then, you know, you can go to the standing orders of the, the, the national parliament and see what it says. And he's saying that according to the House of Representatives, Section 410, it deals with uh, the, 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 house, the, the, the house clerk, the house clerk, uh, let, me, let me use his term. Let me get it here. Section, House of Representatives, Section 410, if after holding of a ballot, paragraph 9, the clerk must determine by lot which candidate will be eliminated so that they can go ahead and select a, a presiding officer if they still have that 6-6 six, six gridlock. Well, to speak about it, well, it's deadlock, really. To speak about it is attorney at law and president of the Tobago Lawyers Association, Mrs. Dawn Palakdarisin Wheeler. Palakdari Wheeler, good morning to you. It is Palak Darisin Wheeler. Good morning to you, Mrs. Wheeler. Good morning, Ms. Lagoa. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. So you heard the conversation with Farley Augustine. Let's go straight to that, because before, we were all of the opinion that it seems as if the only way to treat with this is to go back to the polls. But he's saying that's not going to be so easy. If you've looked at these standing orders, do you think this really paves the way for the uh, members, the assemblymen, to elect a presiding officer? I had an opportunity to have a quick look at it after Mr. Augustine made the point. Yeah. And I have to say, there seems to be some merit to what he has said um, at first blush of reading both the Tobago House of Assembly standing orders in conjunction then with the standing orders for the House of Representatives. So it's not unusual that um, one piece of legislation might refer and say that if this point is silent, yeah. we adopt the procedure in another set of rules um, similarly formulated. And that seems to be what Mr. Gasson is referring to and what does seem um, has some merit that could be triggered. So in fact, I'm actually thinking whether or not they have any option in the matter. And that goes um, perhaps to the wording of the standing orders themselves, of course. Yeah. And um, the way that 90, Section 92.1 is worded for the Tobago House of Assembly standing orders, in any matter not herein provided for, resort shall, and lawyers like to make um, lots of um, emphasis on the use of shall versus me, it says shall be had to the usage and practice of the House of Representatives of Trinidad and Tobago, which shall be followed as far as the same may be applicable to this assembly and not inconsistent with these standing orders, nor with the practice of this assembly. Uh, that is that is quite an interesting provision. Yeah. And it does take us back to the parliamentary standing orders, which does lay out a procedure for breaking uh, a tie. Now, the question is, um, is there discretion in reverting to that interpretation, or are they bound by what um, Mr. Gusson has raised this morning? And if they are bound by it, what we essentially will have is a, a lottery, a casting, a casting of a lot. It's really a random draw, as I understand it. Um, quite a lot will hinge on someone pulling out the right name. Yeah. But let us talk about that. He says that a clerk is any public officer because, you know, public servant, because they are always there, you know, assemblymen come and go, but they stay in the system. Who in this instance, is it just any uh, uh, public servant? Who is it that will, you know, seek to cast this vote, so to speak, or to flip a coin and determine who the presiding officer is if none of the political parties give way? I'm not quite sure in this instance, um, but the Tobago House of Assembly functions um, similarly to the House of Representatives in terms of being staffed. And I don't anticipate that would be a problem in terms of 
um, agreeing who the clerk for the purpose of this section might be. Right. Well, let us hope that they're able to do that. But I mean, imagine this thing is just so dynamic. Last night, we were talking about the way forward. Now this morning, we're seeing, as you said, there might be some merit to what Farley Augustine has proposed to us, which is going through the standing orders. But isn't it something that up until yesterday, nobody seemed to have been aware that these standing orders are there and can determine a way forward? I admit, um, I have been uh, looking on at the analysis, both in the media and discussion with colleagues. And I admit, this is the first time I've been hearing um, this possible avenue for determining the deadlock. But that is, um, it's because I suppose we're in a unique situation. Elections, really, by Tuesday, we were now discussing what was to happen. And, and that's the law for you, something, um, buried deep within the last sections could really change what might um, the outcome be. Right. And let us look at whether or not they're able to have a fresh elections, because I think it seemed as if the PDP is not necessarily leaning to that while the PNM is going back to the polls. Is that something that is possible? Let's say these standing orders don't work and we are in the 6-6 six -six, uh, deadlock. How would, how would they be able to trigger fresh elections? That too was of some concern to me because um, in, almost immediately people started to talk about going back to the polls, but it's not quite that easy or automatic to trigger a fresh election. So there would have to have been a dissolution of the House, and one would then have to um, examine how the dissolution could come about, um, who needs to agree to a dissolution of the House, and uh, uh, whether you can have those procedures in place without a presiding officer, which is um, what would have brought you to that position of trying to dissolve the house in the first place because there was some sort of deadlock on the presiding officer. So in other words, it seems as if everything rests on whether or not there is a presiding officer in place. Quite a lot rests on whether or not there's a presiding officer in place. Let's say we um, get. There was also. Go ahead. There was also some um, hot debate on what happens in the interim when, um, in, in two particular periods, what's happening now is there a void or a vacuum for the positions of chief secretary and secretaries. And uh, if you agree that the chief secretary and secretaries are holding over and this. Um, Tim, until the election of a new chief secretary, what happens if you are able to swear in the members today, but you are not able to determine the issue of a presiding officer, um, what then occurs? Do they still hold over in that interim? And you're right, Mrs. Pallet Garrison Wheeler. I was thinking about it because in my mind, it's one thing, as far as I understand the law, is that whomever the chief secretary is now, which is Ansel Dennis, maintains the portfolio until a new chief secretary is installed. That's my understanding. However, would that still hold if we have a new assembly uh, sworn in? That is, um, that was the question, and I have to lean towards that yes, he still holds over not just him, but also the deputy secretary and the secretaries. It seems to fly in the face of what the elections would have meant and what the swearing in of new members would have meant. I admit it looks, it, it seems like that could not possibly what it would have been intended for. But the flip side to that is it also must have been um, the intention to not leave a vacuum in the interim. It, you should not have a position. It could not be intended that at any point Tobago would not have these critical posts filled. Right. And, and, and I think when it comes on to the law, these are the little things that people look at, what the law meant, even the things that it's silent on. You know, how do you address those? Because as you said, I, I don't think that the THA Act is seek, sought to have any point in time or any law that would say there is nobody in charge or nothing can be done at this time. But, but this is what I'm saying. Even though, you know, it might be looking at that. When you swear in a new assembly, isn't that in itself paving the way to say you're out with the old and in with the new? 
isn't that then acceptance that there is a new regime, and but that regime does not have a chief secretary? I admit, um, yes, but it's the wording of section 36.1b that um, has me, has caused pause for thought in terms of simply saying, well, new assemblymen have been sworn in. It can't be that people are holding over from old posts, but it's the wording, which is basically, the chief secretary shall vacate his office a, for any other reason other than a dissolution of the assembly, he ceases to be a member, and B, and this is the important one, immediately before the administering of the oath under Section 8 to himself, if he is re-elected or to his successor, the word immediately, bef immediately, and that phrase immediately before the administering of the oath tells me that up until just the moment before, you swearing the new chief secretary, the former chief secretary holds over, thereby ensuring that you don't have any void or vacuum in the position. Right, so in other words, even if you have the new assemblyman sworn in, the fact that the section 361B speaks to immediately before swearing in himself or his predecessor, it means that he remains chief secretary. All right, in my so opinion, Yes. So for now, we have a chief secretary. But what happens, let's say, the assemblymen are sworn in. According to what Section 361B is suggesting, the assemblymen are sworn in, still recognizing Ansel Dennis as chief secretary. Does that, in and of itself, give a pathway or clears a way to say, OK, how do we, does it, does it influence any at all how we treat with the 6-6 six, six, uh, dead, deadlock that we're experiencing in getting another chief secretary? Is there anything somewhere in there that could treat with that? Um, there's been speculation. I, I can say that there's been speculation that if he currently holds the position of chief secretary, what then stops him from advising the president that he would like new secretaries and divisions appointed, thereby almost continuing as if he had been sworn in as a chief secretary, the other steps of appointing new secretaries, and more importantly, counselors, which may then break the deadlock in voting. And, and this is what I'm saying. We really are in a conundrum, aren't we? Yes, we are, because we, we have to balance and weigh um, all avenues. Because at the end of the day, what we want is what's in the best interest of Tobago and Tobagonians. And we want to feel, and we don't want any section of society to feel they've been disenfranchised by legal maneuvers. It's, yeah. it's going to um, make... Uh, the next four years very difficult if one side has felt that they were um, mavericked out of power. Now, that might make the casting of lots um, a little more attractive because you're relying on either Lady Luck or Divine Intervention. Yeah. But you know um, what, I, I see we have a minute left in this interview. If, if there are changes that have to be made to the law as a lawyer, what do you suggest those changes need to be immediately so that we don't end up in a situation like this again? I, I, had, I did give this some thoughts because I did hear the call for the, um, the other act to be proclaimed. Um, and, and delve immediately into that, and that would solve the problems. I don't agree that that's the best course of action. Um, there has been previous amendments to the THA Act, and I would kind of lean in favor to possibly putting in a section that allows the president of Trinidad and Tobago some discretion or this, some discretion in deciding how to proceed with the appointment of a presiding officer, or even a discretion in, in the opinion of the president if it can't be resolved 
the power to dissolve and go back to the poles. Doesn't she have that power now at all? Is there anything in law that would allow the president, the, the, the producer gave me an additional two minutes. Uh, isn't there anything in law that would allow the president to say, okay, this is what you, know, you can do, dissolve the parliament. We always talk about the president just being a titular head, but isn't there anything in law that gives her that kind of power now as it is? Not that I've seen as yet, because the THA is a creature of statute, um, we would, our lawyers would tend to definitely rely on what is contained in statute first, point us to the section that says that. Um, I haven't seen anything that allows that just yet, um, and it certainly would clarify the position if that amendment was made. Right. One of the things Mr. Augustine said to me that it's not going to be so easy to go back to the parliament to trigger fresh elections, citing the fact that there has to be a change in the law before they go back to the parliament. Do you share these views? I agree, because what his concern was is fresh elections can put us right back where we are. There's no guarantee that the results will change significantly. Um, so from that point of view, the position of the deadlock is untenable moving forward. There needs to be a, a way to break it. Now, some would argue by the virtue of what we had just spoken about, there is a way to break it by lots. And why are we not availing ourselves of that avenue? Yeah. Just because it might not be something um, that sits well with people doesn't mean that we can simply ignore it. If so... If there's one positive thing that you think we can take away from this, uh, Mrs. Palak Singh Wheeler, what do you think it is? Law is breeding and evolving, and we need to pay attention to our laws on the book. They need to be updated, especially the laws on governance. What may have worked um, in the last 20 years, there's no guarantee it will continue to work in the future. We need to continue to assess the law on a regular basis in relation to governance and keep updated to fit the needs of our society. All right, we do have to leave it there, but thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Uh, President of the, the Tobago Lawyers Association, Mrs. Dawn Palak Darising Wheeler, talking to us. And she says there might be some merit in what Farley Augustine said that according to the standing orders in the THA that are silent on the issue, that you can go to the national standing orders of the national parliament, which is, speaks to what happens when you have this deadlock. So let's see if that's going to happen. We take a break and we'll be back with you.